Um, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So hopefully what we have going on here is we have streaming online, and I'll try and have a microphone next to me, streaming online, and then I'm trying to record something, I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit more technologically savvy, so what I'm doing is I'm recording it on my phone, and then after that, I'm going to put my PowerPoint into the recording and then have it on online. Now, I know we've seen it, but it's not as, I, I'm not, this is total, I need, I need somebody like a, who was born 20 years after me to be able to help me do that. If anybody's willing to help me, I'll have everything hopefully by the end. Okay, thanks. I'll have the audio uh, might not be so good on the streaming, but the audio will, is going directly to the phone so that it'll pick up um, my voice as we're going, um, as it's recording. Okay, so tonight it's actually really important for me that we all go through this material and we go through it a couple of times. Um, the idea of Orthodox Christian formation. There is a way that it works and there's a way that it doesn't work. I don't know how many of us have actually... Um, been involved in a life where it is working. I think this is where Egypt really kind of comes into play. Egypt has more of this idea of holistic um, formation. Whereas here we are, you know, at church a little bit of the time and then we go home and then we go to school. So there's lots of different things that happen to us here, but we have to understand what it, what it means to be Orthodox and to be Christian and to be formed in the church. And we're going to go through this. Now, I'm going to go through this a bit quickly, but at the same time, I'm willing to make, break this up into two parts. Uh, so, at, if at any moment in time we find that this is going a little too fast or we need to pause or we need to talk about things, um, feel free just to say, hey, Abuna, can you slow down? Because, unfortunately, this is probably a two-hour talk uh, if we did it. Um, at a nice pace. So the first thing we have to understand is when we talk about Orthodox Christian formation, when we're talking about what it means to be formed and educated in the church, we have to enter into the world of the church at the time the church came into existence. So the church doesn't come into the scene uh, around after, the, after Christ sends the Holy Spirit on the disciples and say, okay, we got a whole different way of educating that we're going to do. No, it, it becomes uh, the, the Jewish world with the Greek world at that time enter into the church and, and basically the things that were used outside begin to be used inside. Um, and so this is a whole different lifestyle, a whole different, if you, so to speak, a whole different ball, ball game. And we don't think about this because what we do now, 21st century, is we take what, what's being done in schools and we want to apply that into the church. And so we have something that's called Sunday school. And then we have other ideas about how we think the, school, the church should run its quote-unquote educational programs. Um, and what we need to do is kind of take a step back and say, these aren't educational programs. This is about formation, spiritual formation. Um, and in the, in the Jewish world, um, and, and we had a whole talk on this, I'm not going to go back to it, but we did a whole Bible study on Jewish education. Um, and real quick, it was, everything was done by the family, everything was done by the family, and was based on God's law. Fast forward to St. John Chrysostom in the 4th century, St. John Chrysostom says, Christian education is your responsibility. We're just helping you out. And he's taking this mentality, going back to everything is done by the family. It was important that the children understand or understood that the Jewish people were God's people. And therefore, they lived their lives in God's way. So everything that was done in the Jewish home was to impress upon the, them, the, the, the individuals, we are God's people. And we do things according to God's commandments. Um, they lived their lives that way. And by maintaining the integrity of their educational beliefs, they also maintained their way of life. And by maintaining their way of life, they maintained their educational system because they were intertwined. Their way of life was education. Education as a way of life. They have a word for that. And it was translated as discipline or instruction. Shema. 
the, the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And in Hebrew, that word, Shema, means to hear with the intent to obey. And that whole thing on the right is, is basically like a commentary. Well, and this commentary was saying basically the greatest thing you can do is learn the Torah. And it's greater than the priesthood and it's greater than royalty. Because royalty has 30 stages and the priesthood has 24, but the Torah requires 48. How do you learn the Torah? And he goes to that 48 right there by study, attentive listening, proper speech by an understanding heart, by an intelligent heart, by awe, by fear, by humility, by joy. We could spend a long time just on, that's essentially how to read scripture, how to read the law of God. This is in the background when we think about education and formation in the church, this is in the background of the minds uh, uh, of those who were in the church from the very beginning, when, when Christianity kind of becomes its own entity aside from Judaism, this is still running in the back of their minds. And we take from this the idea that Scripture and the law of God have to be firmly established in the home. And then you had classical uh, uh, Greek education. Greek education today, we, we would call it classical education. Classical education um, has its uh, primary elements, which is uh, rhetoric, logic, and grammar. And then afterwards, included with that would be gymnastics, that's the training of the body, um, poetry and music, things that were beautiful, mathematics, of course, the sciences, um, and theology would be part of this as well. This was a complete pedagogical course of study necessary to produce a well-rounded, fully educated citizen. I'm just coming back from Chicago, where I spoke to the St. Mark's, um, it's a little church in Chicago, I'm, Mike, Mike came and uh, Mike was grown, raised in that church. I saw holes in the wall that he had created um, that were still there. Um, but um, I talked to them about classical education. This is the next conversation we have to have as a, as, as a church. Classical education as opposed to public school education. Um, public school education is, uh, many of you already know, um, is, is uh, dangerous. Um, is serving the agendas of the state, um, serving the agendas of the world, whereas in our, in our life what we need is this classical education which was the create. Right now what, what education is? Job training. Job training. It's not education. And not, even, not only that, if I told the, the, this generation, hey, if I give you this computer and you hit enter, um, uh, every other second for the rest of the day and I'd give you a million dollars, they would all do that. They would say, oh great, a million dollars. Just I have to hit enter, that's all I have to do. I've taught them, I don't need science, I don't need math, I, don't, I just hit enter, and I'll make money and I'll live, everybody will be fine with that. That's not a well-rounded individual. And that's where our generation um, is failing in teaching the next generation about what it means to be educated. This education was meant to humanize a person. Not to train the person to do things, but to train the person to be um, the glory of God. And I, I mentioned this before, uh, philosophers and intellectuals and many people during this age would say the greatest thing you could do as a human being is to live a life of virtue. The greatest pursuit you can do is to live a life of virtue. And that virtue would be embodied in you, ingrained in you. That virtue, that virtue would mean, mean you would be a person that was committed to truth, committed to goodness, committed to uh, justice, committed to righteousness. This is what was to be sown in you. And the idea of classical education is, we'll teach you these things, we'll teach you grammar, rhetoric, logic, and then you will be able to handle everything else. So for example, when we talk about logic, right, and truth, what logic, you know, sometimes we think it's like this course in, in college that um, some people take, or maybe you have to take. Um, rhetoric is just about speaking. But uh, something simple as logic, and I was pointing this out to the group over there, is the truth that, that our public school system wants to impose and impress upon us. The truth is, they say, that there is no absolute truth. That what's true for you, it doesn't necessarily have to be true for me. 
But logically speaking, that can't be, that can't be true. Because then that's an absolute truth. You're saying there's no absolute truth except the fact that there's no absolute truth doesn't make sense. Why do I have to accept your truth? It's just something simple. But logic would tell us that from the very beginning. I can't accept something that uh, doesn't hold water. Um, and, and at the same time, we are understanding truth and beauty and goodness as objective, not as subjective. This has to be very important for us to understand. It was always objective during this time. Um, and it continued to be objective, small history lesson, uh, up until the Enlightenment movement, when the Enlightenment philosophers said, we want to separate ourselves from the church, and we want to know things without the church telling us. Like, that we don't want the church to tell us what's right and wrong. We'll decide. We don't want the church to tell us what's true. We'll decide. That became what's known as the modern age, and then we jump into today is the postmodern age. Postmodern age is anything can mean anything. Literally, anything can mean anything. So there are also presuppositions that we have to understand. The church's form of teaching is mostly non-verbal. No matter what I tell you, no matter what I do, no matter what I say to you, and no matter what you turn around and you do and you say to others or your kids, most of Education happens through imitation. You say monkey see, monkey do. That's how the kids learn. That's how they learn everything. Um, and so most of the church, and the church was never set up to be like lectures after lectures after lectures. The church was about the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. And it teaches by being themselves. What does that mean? It, it, it's not that... The sacrament, uh, we stop and we say, okay, we're doing this because of X, Y, and Z reasons, and we're doing that, and we use the sacraments to educate. No, the education is in what we do. So what does that mean? We come in here, front and center is Christ. We come in here, everybody is, is put on the same level. right? Nobody is more important, there's no like um, uh, more important seating, although some places you go, there are people that that's their seat, that's where they sit, they've, you know, pretty much feel like they purchased the bench. But in the church, everyone, it's, it's pure equality. Sayyidna, the Pope, doesn't get, a, doesn't get um, um, more of the divinity of God through, this, through the Eucharist than you or me or the little children. Everybody is given equally in the church. All of this forms us and educates us. In addition to that formation and education, we, we come to solemn points where, like, we read the Bible. We stand with the reading of the Bible. At the point uh, when we're about to take the sacrament, there's a lot of bowing and prostrations. All of that is educating us, is teaching us. And this understanding is a key concept. The, the, the services are education. They're not performing education. And, and let me give it to you a different way. I like this word education. I'll, I'll, I'll define it from the very beginning as to lead out. That's what education is. And I'll come back to this again. That's the Latin word. And, and modern education takes out Latin, takes out Greek, thinking that these are dead languages. Why would we need dead languages? We don't speak these languages. But if you learn just one word in Latin, it'll, it'll give you ten words in English. One word in Greek, the same thing. And probably the doctors can tell us that their anatomy and physiology is, is, is filled with, with these terms. There's use. Not only that, it teaches us English grammar um, as well. But, but going back to the idea of... Um, education to lead out. Um, maybe a hundred years ago or so, it was common to speak about education um, in a way like if a tree was coming out slanted, they educated the tree by making it straight. Of course, the education was not speaking to the tree, come on, 90, 50 degrees this way or 40 degrees that way, you can do it, um, I believe in you. No, it was putting a stick in the ground and wrapping the tree to the stick and hoping that it would it would um, uh, right itself. And so the world of the church in the first century had a different mentality of the purpose of education and what is meant by being a human being. It had a different way of going about it and it had a different goal. Christianity, we have to understand, especially Orthodox, especially Orthodox Christianity, is primarily liturgical. And we are a liturgical community. And in understanding that point, the first thing, imagine Pentecost, 
Holy Spirit comes upon them. And you have a room of 120 people. Christianity is born. What do they do? Do they sit down and say, okay, 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 we need to come down, come up with a creed and some theological statements before we can go out and publicize, publicize ourselves to the world? We need to tell people uh, who we are, have a clear vision, clear mission, clear direction. We need to start collecting money. No, none of that. All of it was worship. Before there was dogma, before there was doctrine, before there were theological treatises, before there were um, patristic writings, writings of the fathers, before any of that, there was worship. And the church was a worshiping community. And that's how we learn to be Christians in the worship. So then the formation. What is formed? What is formed? We have three things that we attack, or three things that we're trying to form. Body, mind, and soul. It's starting just with soul. I can tell you, the world does not care about forming your soul. And that's where virtue is formed. That's where the relationship with God is formed. That's where love between you and your brother and your sister and your neighbor, that's where that happens. The school is, does not care. It's incidental. It doesn't care about your morality. We're in an age where there is moral relativism. And of course it comes out with the sexual issues. But, but it's just a slippery slope. I mean, we're at that point where people can argue whether or not it's right to... to um, um, they would argue the morality of um, you know, Hamas going in and killing uh, women and children. Um, they would argue the morality of Israel going and uh, committing genocide. And they find sometimes root in the, in the Bible. Anyway, for us, we have to understand the church is here to form us body, mind, and spirit. So what does the church do in terms of the body? We know what the society does. You know, you have soccer practice, you have... Um, the body is, it's, and it's so important, so essential that kids are physically active. It is an essential part of their formation as human beings. A kid that sits in front of a TV is not being formed. A kid that is, you know, gaming all the time is not being formed. Controlling the body's desires and movements, because the body has to be strengthened in a way to do and not to do, right? That, that, that control... I'm about to get into a fight. I'm, not going, I'm going to self-control myself not to get into a fight. And why do we, how do we do this in the church? This is through fasting, through prostrations, through works for the glory of God's service. Now, remember when I, when I told you a long time ago, um, when you come into church, there are things to do. Candles to be lit, uh, prostrations to be done, icons to be kissed. This is part of formation. Not only here, but at home as well. This is where the body is trained automatically. I'm in, an, I'm in front of an icon. It's not a work of art. This is the representation of the saint. Let me greet that saint. This is the body working with the mind, working with um, the heart to train the person. We train ourselves by doing the sign of the cross in the morning. We train ourselves uh, physically through our fasting, like I said before and drawing prostrations at home. We're going to get into the levels and the steps of doing this, but I just want us to see how even just standing, how many of you guys are like, if I have to stand for another, you know, three minutes, and you know, we're doing this like as if it's like impossible. Um, and it's, you know, I, for us, I'm being, you know, sarcastic with you, joke, just joking with you, but the idea is that just even training myself to stand. No, I can stand a little bit longer. There's going to come a time where our knees are going to buckle, our hips are going to have pain, our back has pain, whatever it is. But I'll tell you, those that stand receive the reward. And those that stand carrying the children receive the reward and the back pain uh, to go with it. But they receive that. That is what we're to do. Then we have the training of our minds. Education is an essential part of our church from the very beginning. And we are to love the Lord our God with all of our mind. All of our mind. And what does that mean? That means I have to grow in the knowledge of God. And we do this by our studying. We do this by our reading. We do this, are we listening? By our memorization. I was talking with um, one of the priests and the priest was talking with, you know, just about the idea of memorization. We don't think it's a priority. We don't think it's essential. But we ask ourselves, what is the purpose of memorization? 
The purpose of memorization is that so when I pray, I'm not reading, I'm meditating. Right? When I say, uh, when I'm reading the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, leads me. I'm just kind of going from word to word. I'm just trying to read the psalm. Maybe I'm praying it at the same time, but there's a time where I might be in extreme fear. And I need that word, those words to be there in my mind and in my heart so that I can meditate on those words. The Lord is my shepherd is just one. But even all of the verses that I'm giving to you, I'm also trying to encourage you guys as well to give these to your children. This is part of their formation. And when we were younger, I don't know about education. I, I had cousins in Egypt. They told me they memorized uh, long um, passages of poetry uh, in Arabic. Uh, we had to do the same, whether it was... Um, political statements or uh, speeches that were given or P Shakespeare plays or whatever, all of that stuff, that memorization was not to put on a show. That memorization was a training of the mind. A training of the mind so that our minds are not just, we can't remember a phone number now. We can't remember, you know, our, our own um, children's birthdays. Not me, though. I can remember. They remind me. Uh, one of my kids still tells me, 364 days till my birthday, 364 days, you know, so I, I get the, the reminders. Then when we talk about the spirit and the soul, we're talking about prayer, praise, and worship. How do we train the soul? The soul, I've, we've used this word before, the noetic part of the, you can say the noetic part of the heart. The noose has been defined and described in various ways. In Orthodox theology, the noose refers not to the rational operation of the mind, but to that part of the soul that allows the human person to know God, the purest part of the soul, the eye of the soul, if we want to say it that way. If your children do not have that developed, especially by the age of 18, especially by the time they go to college, then we are in a losing battle the world will take them very quickly. It's like, it's like the idea that you um, are, are completely blind to the spiritual life. And you can grow to be blind to the spiritual life. We, can, we are human beings after all. So human beings, if we eat and we drink and we have friends, that's enough to satisfy a human being. But we're not only human beings. We're, we're body, mind, and soul. And so a lot of what happens is the depression and the mental and the anxiety and the mental illness attacks that part of the of the of the human. And and what does society want to do with that? Dr. Robert wants to medicate it, right? We have our own in-house psychiatrist. We want to medicate it. We don't want to train it in any other way other than to sedate it and to give it medicine to take care of it. This is the part that requires the spiritual father. This is the part that requires daily attention. This needs to be nourished, nurtured and, and nourished from a young age. This is, remember I told you about how we know our mothers love us. We know that in that part of the body, not here intellectually. And I always kind of joke around with kids, how do you know your mom loves you? They say, oh, she makes me food. She buys me clothes. I say, so, okay, I'm gonna start buying you clothes and making you food. Does that mean I love you as much as your mom loves you? No, no way. Because it's not about just this intel, it's about the heart feeling it, the heart sensing it. And that part, public schools essentially don't care about. Um, Catholic schools may care about it, but they have a different agenda as well. And I've seen parents and kids who are entirely focused on getting good grades, and they get their good grades, I've seen parents and kids entirely focused on other parts of their lives. They might do very well um, in, in other aspects, but the church needs to be prioritized. And the formation, remember, we're talking about what is formed in the church. When you bring your kids to church, when you come to church, all three of those are to be formed. And that is what is essential for us to understand. Quickly, there are metaphors for education that apply in the church and apply outside. And, and I'll tell you what they are. I'll give you three. There are others. One that I don't have here, which is what public schools do, 
is the manufacturing factory mentality. The kid goes on the conveyor belt, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, doesn't matter if they do well, don't do well. They're going to hear the same lesson that was given last year on the same time. They're going to be given the same test with a little bit of difference. Yani, this is, has to apply. They have to be able to survive in that system. It's the conveyor belt. Thank God for, uh, we can, th not, not thank God, but we can thank people like George Bush uh, Jr., who uh, had the program uh, Leave No Child Behind. And from that, we had uh, standards being dropped, grades. Um, grades were basically inflated so that not everybody, was, nobody could fail and everybody would be passed. And, and the level of education went down. And sometimes we have the same mentality in the church. Sunday school teachers will say, I have a lesson on the curriculum, I could deliver it today. And they go, da, 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 da. I don't care if you understood anything, I don't care if you got it, maybe you can sing a song, clap your hands, and go. I'm not saying our Sunday school teachers. Our Sunday school teachers are better than that. But that mentality is in the idea of a curriculum, to, to say the least. To say the least. To say to a, a Sunday school teacher, this is your lesson for the day. If they don't have the wherewithal to say, hey kids, do you have any questions from this week? Did you read anything this week that you might have a question about? If the kids are not being offered that opportunity, they're not going to come, they're going to come to the church with their minds closed, their mouth closed, let me just get through this lesson, and then we're going to go on. That's the con this is the conveyor belt mentality. But, but, but what we need to focus on are these other two metaphors, the idea of growth, garden. We have lots of plants around here, which I love. The gardening metaphor, the, you have the curriculum and the school as the garden. The teacher is the gardener, the students are the plants that, look, that are looking to thrive. What we do with the uh, persimmon tree, is, is what we do differently with the grapevines. And you can see the different things that we are doing with different plants, different amounts of water, different amounts of fertilizer. Every student is, un is unique and different. Right now, we live in a, in a schooling system where if there's a special needs kid, they're given, they're, they're kind of isolated, put to the side. But, but why? Why would we need that? That's like you know, a very rare plant, for, so to speak. So we give it attention. We, and there should be no problem with that, that plant being with the other plants. Um, and in our, in our Sunday school system, we need to think about this more often and to see how to engage all kids. We can't just say this, this kid is too she'i for us or too active or too hyperactive. We can't, we can't approach it in that mentality. We have to say this is a plant that needs special attention. The other mentality or the other metaphor is that of a journey. And I love this. And some Sunday school systems, they have this where the kindergarten teacher goes with the, the students to first grade, to second grade, to third grade. Yeah, it's done. I don't know the pluses or the minuses about it, but I've heard about it. And it's still to this day applied in some schools where you have your teacher for life, essentially. The curriculum is the journey. And what does curriculum mean, by the way? We should, we should um, define that. Curriculum is the course, the course that is to be run. It's actually better in Arabic. Uh, the word in Arabic is uh, menhag, right? This is like kind of the, the, the way that it's supposed to go, the way that we're going. Curriculum is the course and education is leading out and the educator is the one that's leading out, the guide. Educator is a mentor. The teacher is accompanying the person. And this, this kind of, com it's like exciting and it also um, gives the teacher sort of goals to shoot for but doesn't necessarily force, um, force the issue. I'm sorry. So religious education now it has to be what's, it has to be total and all-encompassing. Religious education can't be something that you pop in and, and, the, and the priest does something or the Sunday school teacher does something. It needs, it requires liturgy. It requires, um, uh, it requires work at home. It requires everyone to be, it's, and it has to be understood as lifelong and life-wide. You guys are now in Sunday school. I am teaching you. This is now your lifelong education. It has to be this way. It can't just be this time where we look, I know everything. I don't need to go back to church. I don't need to see anything or talk, um, talk to anybody about anything. I need to constantly be taught this stuff. It has to be total. And that means that there needs to be a partnership. Right? We talk about SJC as a community. It needs to be a community in this partnership as well. A partnership of church, family, and Sunday school engaging all aspects of life and every member, in sharing the faith together, and that we're all lifelong disciples of Christ. And for this, these purposes, um, 
Groom, he talks about religious education as a school of faith, and it's an apprenticeship for our entire Christian life. I like that word apprenticeship. It's not used often. We don't talk about apprenticeships now because it's not too much in our system. But essentially, essentially, what we want to do is that, you know, you want to become a doctor, you would shadow a doctor for so many years, and you would continue to excel in your, um, in your craft as a doctor by uh, visiting others and learning different techniques. And that's essentially what happens in a lot of these professions, but not in the Christian church so much. It's clear that there is no one program or approach that will ever be able to provide complete teaching. He uses permanent catechesis, but complete teaching required by every Christian person and community from womb to, from womb to tomb. There's nothing, there's no one program. It needs to be a, um, a joining of so many different programs, and it has to involve the family, the parish, and the community. I'm going to... I'm going to talk to you guys about um, cell phone usage at some point in time. I'm just going to give you, um, I, I want to present an argument to you that cell phones should not be in the hands of kids. They should not have cell phones until freshman year of high school, and they should not be in, on social media until at least junior year of high school. But if, let's say, Miriam agrees with this, but George doesn't, and Sandy don't, and so their kids get it, the other kids are going to just say, I need it, I need it, my family has it, whatever. But if as a community we can accept this, and if we can also put this in the schools and fight for this in the schools, my son's school is, 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 has, has moved to that next year, no schools on campus. I don't want, I don't want phones on, on campus. I, I want people to come and talk to each other. Um, I, don't want a kid, I don't want to see a kid sitting next to other kids and everybody's on their phone. It's enough, it's enough what this is, how this is torturing our kids. And the science behind it, or the data behind it, is that mental illness skyrocketed with the, increase of so, with the, with the introduction of social media and the front-facing camera. 2012, goes like this. Chart goes like this, and then like this. Mental illness, anxiety, depression, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and suicide, suicide rates. And there's this uh, Anxious Generation, this book, Anxious Generation, um, written by Jonathan Haidt. It's too many consonants. It's in H-A-I-D-T, I think. G-D-T, something like that. Um, but I'll, I'll offer that with you. But this is something where we'd have to be a partnership together to do that. We'd have to say, we'd have to all agree. Otherwise, it would, it would dismantle. But that's also a part of everything. We'd have to all agree to come to church. We have to all agree to participate in the sacraments. We have to all agree on some level in our involvement. We have to all agree about the fasts, right? That's essentially what the church has, has, has prepared and given to us. However, there's always pockets of people that will be like, ah, I'm not doing that. Ah, oh, yeah, and they, and they bring people. I, I called it um, spiritual Ebola because it, it's just so contagious and so easy. So there's these three aims of religious education. We want to live a life in the church in complete unity with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is the aim of all the formation, is to live a life in the church. You, you know you're successful when your kids are rooted in the church. The second aim is that edu religious education has to involve the entire community, all of its members, as lifelong students and teachers. We're constantly learning, we're constantly being taught. Even I myself, as, as somebody who teaches from time to time, I'm always trying to learn. I'm, I'm stuck in books, I'm calling people, I'm asking advice. It has to be this way. Um, otherwise, we're, we're kind of just faking it and we're going to lose it after a while. And the third thing... Mm. The third is that... Um, if I remember correctly, the third is that religious education has to be holistic. Whole body, mind, and spirit. And we talked about that. So it has to be body, mind, and spirit, number three. Number two is that it has to be lifelong and, in, and, and include everyone. And number one, which is the main goal and aim, is to be living a life in unity with the church, with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So ultimately, we want to instruct and nurture and direct each member of the community of faith, the church. In Christian living, the life in Christ, 
so that each person grows in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to become a partaker of the divine nature. And this focus on union is not a focus of intellectual knowledge, but a focus of love. We grow in love for God, grow in love for the church, grow in love for one another. So what's the way to do this? Remember this quote? Remember how I said this to you, maybe last week or the week before? We become what we think, what we hear, what we see. We become what we think, what we hear, what we see. And I said that this is what, when Christ says, the sons of this world are wiser than in their own generation than the sons of light because they understand this. The people on Instagram understand this. The people on TikTok understand this. The influencers on YouTube understand this. Advertising understands this. Product placement understands this. That we become what we think, what we hear, what we see. If I just give it to them enough times, they will become or they will accept. And this is, by the way, this is Disney. Right? This is Disney. This is other corporations, Hollywood, social media, the media itself. If we just float this idea enough times in the face of these people, they will accept. How do we resist that? All of these have to work together in our religious uh, education in the church. Pastoral care, meaning the priest, discipleship. That's a, that's a circle that keeps going round and round. If I'm not being discipled, I, I, I'm not going to be able to take advantage of this religious education and I'm not going to benefit myself. Now, in that, you notice at the very top is liturgy. Liturgy is important and essential. Teaching is on the bottom there. Teaching is important, but it's only one of, we can say, at least six, I, uh, five things. How many of you uh, have gone on trips to Africa or, or mission trips to other parts of the, uh, of the country, of the world? Right? That is part of education. You can't, what you learn on those trips, you're not going to learn from a lecture. You're not going to learn from liturgy. In fact, what you learn in liturgy promotes and helps you in those areas of your service. Fellowship with one another. It's not enough to just come to church, take communion and leave. That's not what it means to be part of the church. And you're not going to learn from your brother and your sister, and you're not going to definitely, you're not going to be able to grow in love for God and to grow in knowledge of Him. Teaching, the didactic, the, the, the sort of the, this, what's happening right now, this is part of it. But we've undone a lot of that by giving a lot of the teaching to either the internet or we give it to the public school system. And so our kids, and, and many of us are not learning what the church has to say. We think the church is archaic. What could the church possibly have to say about whatever issue? And we find that the church not only has things to say about it, but has deep wisdom to share and service. Everybody has to serve. Not just yourselves and not just your families. Because when you serve your family, you're self-serving. But I have to serve outside. And, and that, that can be anything from, from Sunday school, to cleaning the bathrooms, to vacuuming, to going to a soup kitchen, to just finding somebody, one of your neighbors that needs help and just knocking on the door, hey, do you guys need anything? There are three steps that I'm going to offer. And, and, and by the way, this, we're going to come back to this for the rest of my life. I'm going to hammer this home. One of, the, one of the people came up to me and said to me, Abuna, when you come outside, you don't say hi to me. I take that seriously. That, that means I'm, I'm not, the fellowship is not there. I'm, something's missing in my mind. I'm, I'm either preoccupied with something or I didn't see the person, but they, they sensed it. That's what's lacking there. And the religious education that we learn from here, or what we learn from here is how to grow in love and share with one another. To, to, in the, to, to, to feel what the other person feels, to sense what the other person senses, and not to be invisible. A person, nobody wants to be invisible. And I mentioned this one time in uh, another church. I said, you know, there are people here, and I was just, you know, I knew that, that it was there. I said, there are people here that they come to church on Sunday. It's the only time anybody talks to them. And then they go home and they're alone for the rest of the week. And a guy came up to me, he says, Abuna, this is exactly what happens to me. My kids don't talk to me. 
Uh, there's no friends that talk to me. Uh, this other person doesn't talk to me. Even if this is the most difficult person in the world, he deserves to be loved, he deserves to be asked about. Um, three steps. The first step, and this is the step of what, where we start with the kids, is practices, practices and virtues. And you say, what do I teach the kids at the very beginning? What am I supposed to do with my kids? It's that they have to learn to grow in virtue. And that means we give them the faith, we teach them the fear of God, self-restraint, patience, hope, dispassion, meaning uh, not, not um, affected or not uh, having lusts, not having, it's, it's, it's like, how do you get your kid from 30 pounds to 40 pounds to 60 pounds to 80 pounds? How do you do that? One meal at a time, three times a day. Then, so then, how do you do that? You do that very, very intentionally, but very slowly. It's not like, okay, guys, you know, damn it, you're going to learn this lesson today, right now. If you don't, if you, you know, right, it can't be that. It has to be something where it's like, we're going to stand in prayer. We're going to kiss the icons. We're going to learn to love one another. And this comes down to even how we are at the dinner table, how we are in the car, how you are towards the other guys that are drivers on the street. All of that you're teaching your kids. Remember what I said in the very beginning, no matter what you tell them, it's all by imitation. And you can't give them what you don't have. And that's very, yeah, you should, you should beware of that. Church services, any and everything in the church services, icons, candles, hymns, incense, all of that is important for them to experience and to make it a routine. A routine. Routines save us. Rituals save us. They are the things that that stick in the in the minds of the kids so that let's say, God forbid, years later they they leave the church a little bit and they catch a a, 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 a whiff of incense. It brings back the memories of the church, brings them back to those days where they felt safe, they felt everything was good, they felt loved, they felt cared for. And by the and speaking about that, we get that when the church feels like a family, when uncle and aunt are saying hi to kids that aren't even their their relatives. When you say hi to other kids and other families and other, they feel like we we belong. We are not invisible. We are part of a group. But you tell your kids come um, to services, and that means vespers. I think vespers is the easiest service, especially for the young kids. Nobody there's there's. It's never been said during a Vespers prayer, the kids were really loud today. And I can show you videos from the Makar. I don't know if you've seen the Makar these days. There are kids everywhere. And they are loud and they're jumping on Abuna and they're jumping on the Mengeleya and it's chaos, but that's okay. They'll learn. Eventually they'll learn. And my philosophy, for the parents, by the way, my philosophy is let the kids do anything or go anywhere. Don't shush them. So don't shush them and let them walk. Even if these kids... I know it's going to take training from the deacons up here, but even if these kids were to walk into the altar, just leave them. As long as they're not being a danger to themselves, eventually they'll learn. Eventually they'll learn. I've seen this with my, my own children. I never, I, I have pictures of my kids underneath me in, while I'm playing the liturgy. Do you see Justin underneath me now? No. You see, you know, they learn. They learn eventually that's not appropriate, that's not right. And the kids are allowed to roam. I hate those benches and those chairs, to be honest. They would have a lot easier of a time back there. And then you have outside, of course, let them roam outside. Hopefully the sound is there. And we have the, um, the Sunday school room, which if it's never opened, or if it's not open, you can open it, go in, turn on the TV, go to our YouTube channel. But what I'm trying to say is come to Vespers. Nobody's going to complain about the kids and the kids' noise. If you want me to do it earlier, I'll do it earlier. But you have to come. I'm not going to adjust it and then, ah, oh, we have a cruise this week and we have this this week. But I don't want you guys to then say, okay, chalas, we don't. But if, if there's a better time, I'll do it. The other thing, other than the church services, is that in your homes, you have icons, you have candles, you sing hymns, and you burn incense. Not, not like censor and like, I'm a priest now and everything, but on some level, you are the priest of your home. 
But why do we do that? And it's not just to cover up the sense of the house. Why do we do that? So that it feels like church. There are things that you won't do in this place because it's church, even though it's a barn. You feel this is the presence of God, this is where we worship. It should be the same also in your homes. I'm not going to raise my voice. I'm not going to blow up. I feel this. I feel the prayers. I feel the, the sense of peace that comes from the church. Bible reading, and memorization, and ibayat. This was what happens at the very beginning. Your kids, the second they can read, are able to memorize huge passages from the Bible, and they're able to pray the ibayat. And this is the time of their life when they memorize. They begin to have those words, and even if it's just rote and they do it quickly, later on they'll learn to pray. That's in the second step. Fasting and services. As the kids get older, I say, um, and I wanted to have a talk with the preschoolers and the, the parents of the preschoolers. By the age of five, right, take advantage of the kid going to kindergarten. Big boy, big girl. Now you can fast. Now you can, you know, fast before communion. That's that's a good time to sort of shoot, to aim, to get those kids to not have breakfast that day. And when they, you know, they might, you know, oh, I'm hungry. Okay, you can have something small, but you want to be a big boy, a big girl, and this is what everybody else does. They'll get there, but that's about the age. And then when it comes to the other fasts, you just, you know, slowly work in vegan meals for dinner and slowly work in um, different meals where they are quote unquote fasting, meaning they're eating vegan. And then over time, train them on Wednesdays and Fridays. Train yourselves on Wednesdays and Fridays. Train yourselves on Wednesdays and Fridays, train the kids on Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and then they'll learn to fast without food later on. Habits and rituals, I said that. The church has to be safe, peaceful, non-stimulating for them. And this is, I'm, I'm actually thinking, I'm just going to throw it out there, that these screens are, are, are not our best solution for prayer. We're an English church. I do 99% of the stuff in English. And I'm happy to go for myself. I'm happy to go 100% in English. And the screens can be used just for the hymns and for the readings. So like, so like during, you know, when I'm saying, Oh God, the great, the eternal, I'm not just following along. I'm letting those words enter in. I'm learning to listen again. I'm learning to let that go from here to here. And it's, it's something that I'm focusing on. It's just an idea. But what are the enemies of this step? Breaking Saturday nights and Sunday morning routines. Overstimulating and overused entertainment for the kids. If my kid is hooked to Nintendo Switch, he's, he's not going to want to sit quietly in church. I want to do something. This is boring. Right? Uh, religion of sports and extracurriculars. There's a religion, right? There's a place, a holy space, time. And of course, people are usually more attentive to the times of the sports than they are to church. Um, and they make a religion out of this. Um, and, and then also disobedience or speaking poorly about the church, rules, priests, bishops. Be careful what your opinions are. You can have these opinions. I have these opinions. But I don't say them to my kids because I don't want to scandalize them. Right? There are things, and I remember this, I remember growing up, that there were two people I loved. There was this priest and this servant in the church. I loved them, and I loved them even until the day I was ordained. I loved them. And then my mom was like, oh, Fika, you know, by the way, those people uh, didn't like each other. I was like, yeah, it's true. I never noticed them in the same room at the same time, speaking kindly to each other. But my parents knew this, but they didn't talk about it. They didn't, and both of them, great people. Be careful about what you say, because you plant seeds in their minds and in their hearts. Ah. I don't have to listen to the church. I don't have to like the church. I can have my own opinions about the church. But we want to preserve its holiness. Um, step number two is when the, the kids are in their preteen, teenage years, the deeper contemplation and the realization of God. Prayers are now by memory. Um, and prayers are coming from the heart. There's a father confession. I now know when I do something wrong, I have to go. Because I fear God, I go before Him, I confess, and I receive the absolution. I start to read the writings of the fathers and the stories of the saints because they bring me wonder. How is it that this saint lived in the desert? How is it that this woman was able to, um, to die a martyr or to um, uh, encourage her children for that? This is the stage where we need to do more retreats for the kids. 
more monastery trips, more service trips, more mission trips. And this is a time in their life when they begin to do service in the church and service in society. What are the enemies of this step? Lust and love of the world. And that could mean I just want to sleep in. I want to hang out with my friends. Uh, I want to even uh, pursue other things. So um, Sunday is busy. I've had kids that are like, oh, I work on Sundays. And they don't need the money, just an excuse. Um, this is where the passions become a problem. Sexual desire is there, and so the church says you have to control that. Society says you don't have to control that. Laziness or disorganized priorities. But I'm not going to throw it all on the kids and the parents. I'm also going to say, this is the time, if there's poor liturgy, poor religious education, and poor family support, the kids will, will also not grow during this step. What does it mean, poor liturgy? Well, we just come and we don't care if we're praying or not. We're just going to do it. And so we do it, do it this way. And, and poor liturgy is when you kind of go and you feel you're being subjected to it, as opposed to entering into it. And we have to learn to enter into the liturgy and not to feel like it is being thrown on us. But we enter into it and we, we try to, we, we pray. And we encourage others to pray. Poor religious education where the Sunday school program is just about throwing uh, lessons at the kids we, and not developing the knowledge. And whenever there's a question, the questions aren't answered properly. And, the, and when there are um, too, the questions are too difficult, we say, uh, uh, go ask somebody else, or it's not right to ask it. It's, it's been done and it's been said before. But poor religious education, while it can't make up, like, like we can't have like a stellar Sunday school program that's going to make up for everything else. It has its effect to really do damage to everything else if, if Sunday school is not done well. And then poor family support, where the, kid, the, the family, are, we, we encourage our kids to eat well, sleep well, and, and do things that are, you know, what normal kids do. We encourage that's normal life. But we also have to encourage them in their prayers, in their reading the Agabeya, in the memorizing of Psalms, in, in, in whatever. We have to encourage them in their spiritual, which means. I can't let them just do whatever they want all the time. There has to be order and organization. There has to be a time for us to play and have fun. And there's a time for us to pray. There's a time for us to watch TV and to enjoy that. And there's a time for us to uh, read our Bibles. The family has to support that. Um, in this area, this is where if the child, in this during these, these years, it's up to the age of 18, if they don't experience God, and they're not engaged in this, that's a major red flag, and college is going to sweep them away like a rushing current. The third step is the mystical life. This is for all of us. This is where we are enjoying our prayer. We're living a life of repentance. There are tears, and there's a longing for permanent union with Christ. There is a love for all. There's a forgiveness. There's mercy. There's peace. There's joy. This is the stage that you want the kids to taste by the age of like, let's say, 18, 19, 20, and, and it sticks with them and it's, it's kind of um, nourished and, and nurtured the rest of their lives. But if they have at that age a malnourished spiritual life or a lack of community, like people are just not there. Nobody cares about prayer, repentance, tears. If there's laziness, if they're entrenched and distracted by life, life, right? We talk about this, we use that word, uh, life took over. Tomorrow's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If Christ said he is the way, the truth, and the life, what life are we talking about when we say we're distracted from what is necessary? What life are we talking about? Our day-to-day, -day, that's not life. Life is what is eternal, what is permanent, what we want to take on. And then there are poor choices that we've taken, made earlier in life. A lack of faith that God can redeem my life. Like I'm just like, I've got the work, I've got the kids, I've got everything in front of me. I'm, I'm running at a million miles an hour. There's no way God can step in and, and change what's going on right now. You know, you think you have too many liabilities and too many obligations. And that's that really comes down to this lack of faith that God can help. God can move mountains in your life. This third step is based on the other two. Maybe we're there, maybe we're longing to be there, but this is something where we shouldn't allow mistakes of the past 
or our own laziness or whatever our day to day is to distract us from going towards that permanent union with Christ. For you and for your kids, right? We have to not just go with the flow of things. We need to be courageous in understanding that there are things that this world is telling us is okay, but the church is trying to step in and be and, and sort of say, but that's not the way to do things. Right? So it, it could come down to something small and simple like, no, you're not going to, you know, forgive me for being crass, where, where the, the answer to pornography is icons. And, and you say, well, what does that mean? I say, well, in, in, it's exactly the opposite. In a pornographic image, I don't, I close my eyes to Christ in that person as a creation of Christ. And I open my eyes to what is sinful and shameful. But icons are, I close my eyes to the unrealistic parts of this and I open my eyes to the presence of something that's holy and great. The supernatural presence of that saint. This is what the church is trying to teach us. And not only that, we're supposed to move from this back to the person and say, the person is the icon of Christ. If I don't understand that, then pornography is, is I'm not, I'm, I don't understand what the problem is, right? The problem is, I'm not seeing Christ. I'm blind to Christ in this person. The church is teaching us. The church is also teaching us in other ways. Loving the Lord our God and serving Him and worshiping Him. Holding the kids and walking around with it. This is the, this is the job of the parents. We are trying to hold on for as long as possible. Now, now parents, you know, just keep in mind that a side note, I'm getting a lot of complaints about noise. It's not your fault, it's, it's the kid's fault, right? But, but just step out. When it happens, just step out. Um, just so that I, I want the kids in here as long as possible. Don't give up, keep being strong, and I will um, hold them off as long as possible. Um, but you keep the, the, the kids in church through the hymns and through the prayers, they will be formed. I want you to trust them. And then I want you to also encourage the Sunday school system by if there is memorization, take that memorization home, give it to the kids. This is the after school care. This is the homework that you help your kids do in school. This is the homework that is for church. Teach them, teach them to read the Word of God. Teach them to love the Word of God. Teach them, and there are so many sources and resources and tools for them. Teach them to memorize. Reward them for their memorization. Reward them and say, you know, this is good, this is good. And, and you, can, you can encourage them all along the way. I, I, stopped, I stopped making the, the verses of the month because it seems nobody is really bad. I'm spending hundreds of money, of dollars of the church on these things. These are tools for you, you know. And if I say memorize, the natural question would be, what should I memorize? Well, I'm giving you verses and it's one verse a month. Okay. That, if you if you pressure me, I'll I'll feel like okay, there's something of value. And some of the kids they would memorize the verse in one week. I say okay, memorize the whole chapter. Memorization is a tool for the secular world as much as it is for us. Like it's a tool that they will that will help them in life, not only in their spiritual life. Um, and then also when it comes to Sunday school and the Sunday school programs, it's not so much that this is going to be the answer. We need dynamic Sunday school teachers, and we need. We need people that love God and are willing to share that love with people, with the kids. It's lifelong. It's about gardening. Uncle Makar, we were talking about Sunday school like gardening. And I'm sure you could give us lots of spiritual meditations on this. But the idea is that this is something that, what essentially what you've been taught from a young, from a young age, this has been done in the, in the church for thousands of years and before that in the Jewish community for thousands of years. This is something that we have to take hold of and say, no, this is good for us and for our kids. And we have to support each other with this. Do less in the world out there, do more in the world of the church. Don't let the world tell you, like, you know, this is, and the world is not helping us. When I was, when I was growing up and I played football, there were no games on Sunday. That was it. The, the towns, they all agreed, the schools all agreed, there's no games on Sunday, only on Saturday. Now it's games and tournaments and out of town and this and that. But you have to make decisions. 
what's going to be the most value for the for for the longer uh, for the long run? What's going to be of a benefit for them? Now, if you have the next Muhammad Salah, okay, you can make exceptions. But at the same time, we have to understand there, there are ways for us as a society also to push back against them. We raise our voices, why are there games on Sundays? Why don't we have that day off? Why are we, why are we as a society accepting this? Um, and then the other extracurriculars. So I've, I've gone on for uh, a long time and I apologize about that. Are there any questions or comments or anything that you think we need to follow up with and talk about later? I'm not, honestly, I'm not just throwing out lofty ideas. I've seen this, I've seen how it works, and I know that this is the system that the church is, is using. If you don't like the system, you have to think about a different system. But this is the system of the church. It's like, this is the, this is the tools, these are the usage of the tools. If I take a hammer and I want to screw in a, 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 a screw into the wall, it's not going to work. It's going to be very awkward, it's going to be very difficult. What are the tools that we have, what are the purpose of these tools, and how can we use them properly? Um, Question. It's a lot. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and send this out. It's been streamed, and also it is. Um, I'm going to try to mess around with this video and throw the PowerPoint in there as well. Um, but I want you to, to seriously think about this. How can we, as a church, as a community, come together to increase the formation of our children so that they are Orthodox? They are Christian and they are rooted in the church. Um, I'm going to talk to you maybe in a couple of weeks about the public school system and how we have to be vigilant in what the public school system is feeding our kids and how we can, can kind of attack that. And that's going to mean in the Sunday school classrooms as well. All right? Okay. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. We will 